James chapter 3, from verse 13 to chapter 4, verse 12. Hear the word of the Lord. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in, his, in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace? Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks evil against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge. He was able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his holy word. Well, what do you like? I mean, about anything. Well, that's too much, that's too much of a general question, isn't it? Can't answer that. What kind of music do you like? Come on, let us know. Country? Any country music fans? Uh, rock? Allison, you like rock? She's not going to say, not going to commit. Classical, maybe. Mary likes classical. Rap? Got any rap fans here? What kind of food do you like? Chinese? Mexican? Italian? American? Of course, what is American food, anyway? Um, is, is American food a, a good steak and potato or hamburger or fried chicken? No, hamburger? Isn't that originally German, I think? I don't know. It's hard to tell what, is, what is American food sometimes. Is pizza American? Or is it Italian? Is General Chow's chicken American? Or is it Chinese? It, it certainly isn't from China. Uh, it, it's, it was invented in New York. I saw this, this little movie where they took some uh, pictures of General Chow's chicken to, to Beijing, China. And they showed it to people there and they looked at it. What's that? You've never seen it before. You, know, you don't find General Chow's chicken in China. And I've been around the world, though. There, I think there are, th in my opinion, there's three types of food that are popular everywhere. Chinese, Italian, and American, right? We got our, our Burger Kings, our, our McDonald's, our KFCs, I mean, they're just everywhere. Uh, what kind do you like? Maybe you, maybe you like them all. Okay, you know, I'll have one one day, one the other. I like them all. Uh, what kind of sports do you like? You like football, ba basketball, baseball, soccer, NASCAR? Any track and field fans here besides me? Uh, maybe you like them all. You know, your TV is perpetually tuned to ESPN. Or maybe you have a strong preference for one, you know, like me, so that you watch a lot of ESPN from September to January, and then you kind of never watch it in, for the rest of the year. <laughs> then you're just glad it's back on come, come late August when you want to watch it again. Uh, if you do like only one kind of music or food or sport or, or, or whatever, uh, this is the one for you. Do you wonder about people who then who don't share your preference? You know, they, they don't like that thing that you like so much. If they listen to rap, do they have a moral and spiritual problem? Is it? 
I once had a man describing himself as an evangelist message me that playing rap music for the guys on Sunday night, as we do, he said, it's, it's worldly. I said back that the, the style of country music, which like a lot of so-called gospel music is, is basically country music, right, uh, can be worldly too if it's Whiskey River, Take My Mind. You're saying that's not worldly just because it's country style? Uh, John Foreman of Switchfoot said that Christian is not the name of a genre. It's not a kind of music. I, not, not, uh, as far as style of whatever, you know, of, of music, of, of actually playing Christian music is Christian if it has Christian words to it, whether the style is rock or country or whatever, um, or rap for that matter. How about the style of music? The fact is that some people just don't like the style. You know, they kind of associate it with whatever, the gangster life, and, and then they call it worldly because they don't like it. If they don't, if, if they don't like Chinese food, do you think there's something seriously wrong with them? Now, be honest be, and be nice, though. Maybe they have it. Maybe they've never had the real stuff. Maybe that's it. They've just had General Chow's chicken. <laughs> Soon after we got married, and we got married in Singapore, right? I'm living there. I, I took my in-laws out to eat in what is one of my favorite kinds of food, which is Mexican. We had to travel some time by bus to get to one of the few, if not only, Mexican restaurants in Singapore at that time. Uh, they didn't really like it. Too heady, my father-in-law said. I had no idea what that meant. What's too heady? What is it, too hot? I don't know. I don't, I don't think so. Uh, what about spirituality? What kind do you like? Maybe you didn't even know there were different kinds. There are different kinds of spirituality. In other words, what, what kind of person uh, or, are you if you are spiritually mature? You look at somebody, he's spiritually mature. I want to be like him or, or her. That's a spiritual person. Well, you realize there's different opinions on what that looks like. On who that is. Um, there, there are different kinds of spirituality, you know. What, what kind do you like? For a thousand years, professed Christians liked, in other words, they, they looked up to as spiritual monks and nuns, living in poverty and chastity, obedience, living secluded in, in monasteries and convents, practicing disciplines and denying themselves. And now, although we as Protestant evangelical Christians would, you know, criticize uh, the, a lot of the theology that goes into that, the, the, uh, behind that, I think we need to admit that a lot of those people were really spiritual, were really seeking the Lord. They, they gave up a lot to do what they thought was serving God. Uh, now, it amazes me that in America and much of, and much of Africa and in some, some in Asia, uh, many Christians see extravagance you know, wealth, the celebrity pastor with a multi-million dollar house, maybe a silk suit and big puffy hair, uh, a, a private jet, a net worth of maybe five to 12 million or more dollars is totally acceptable. It's even a sign of spirituality that they've been blessed by God and they should just indulge in it. Never asking apparently what it says about him or sometimes her uh, that he kept that much money for himself. The problem, in my opinion, say they write a big best-selling book or they're just popular on the, on the, on the preaching circuit or you know, in speaking, and so they can, a lot of people go here conferences to hear them. Um, and they will pay to hear him. Or, you know. uh, the problem isn't, in my opinion, that they, he's able to make a lot of money. A lot of people are willing to buy his books, listen to him. The problem isn't that he can make a lot of money. The problem is that he keeps it. You understand the big difference? He, he, he's a, there was a lot he could do with that money. Now, so imagine, this is in our day, extravagance, which is close to indulgence, is excused, if not celebrated, as spirituality. And it's not just one kind of Christian either. It's in various traditions. Pentecostal, we want to blame them for it, but there's some, some, uh, some quote, not very popular Reformed speakers seem to have a lot of net worth, according to the Internet, and Baptists too. The Pentecostal ideal of spirituality is to exude a sense of God awareness. Is that your favorite kind? A God awareness of being in tune with the Spirit and expressing it exuberantly. And maybe that's spiritual. The Reformed ideal is more bookish. You know, the, the cool, controlled scholar spending time studying, particularly the Word of God, 
but he, he's committed to his finely tuned doctrines, and that makes him reverential and hopefully modest. The, the Baptist ideal is kind of like that of a, of a smooth politician or salesman. He's a good old boy trying to sell you the gospel, of course, with a winning smile, because his product really is good for you. So what kind do you like? I don't know about the Lutheran. I'm sorry, I didn't let them out. So that's the Lutheran ideal. It's kind of like closer to the Reformed, but maybe not quite. Uh, sometimes, of course, you don't have to choose. You know, you can like Chinese, Mexican, and Italian foods. You know, you, you'll go to any of those places. You, you can be a football, basketball, and baseball fan. You can like all kinds of music. You know, as long as it's well done, I like it, you, your attitude is. Maybe you, maybe you respect the learned, reformed scholar, uh, or you want to learn the charm of the Baptist uh, evangelist, and you wish that preacher guy had a lot more Pentecostal to him. Uh, but sometimes you must choose. Sometimes they are mutually exclusive. You must pick one and reject the other. And here we see three pairs of kinds, three kinds of spirituality, three choices in, we must, in which we must choose one or the other. What kind do you like? First, what kind of wisdom? Second, what kind of friends? Third, what kind of judges? What kind of wisdom do we like? There, there are kinds of wisdom. You know, there's the, there's the wisdom how to succeed in this world, how to, how to win friends and influence people, to, to get ahead, to have our best life now. Uh, in Chinese culture, there's the wisdom of Confucius, Confucianism, which is about how to succeed in, in this life, how to be a good family person. That's, that's a kind of wisdom. James begins asking in chapter, in chapter 3, verse 13, who is wise and understanding among you? How do you know who someone's wise? How do you know? Well, but, you know, how, how? Because they just exude this sense of uh, that they that they know spiritual things, that they're they're sure of themselves, that they're sure they're they have an insight into things maybe you don't. They they know the they know the code because they can quote or maybe maybe they're more reformed because they can quote great theologians of the past. They can cite scriptures and quote Calvin and all that. Because they can, or maybe because they can win you over with a charming little story, well told in a clever turn of phrase. You know, we're saved by faith alone, but faith that saves is never alone. I like that one. Uh, who is wise? How can you tell? James says that if he's really wise, let him show it in his good conduct. In other words, wisdom without works is worldly. You show you have wisdom by doing wise things. You, sh you show it in your conduct, in being able to control yourself and not making foolish decisions, maybe in how you handle your money, uh, uh, decisions about debt, about your business, and the, the way you raise your kids, uh, what, what you believe and what you don't believe. You know, maybe what you hear out there in the world, what you say, hey, that's true, or maybe that's, no, I'm not going to fall for that. You have what he calls at the end of verse 13, the, the meekness of wisdom, an unusual word. You think of wisdom as being meek? That's what he's saying here. Wisdom produces meekness. Wisdom makes you teachable. The wise person knows that he or she doesn't know everything, and so they are willing to learn. True wisdom gives you a humility that makes you, that makes you know that there's a lot you don't know, that you don't have the ability to know everything, Sometimes you don't have the ability to, to judge between, say, competing claims. You don't have the ability, you're not able to, to come to, to the conclusion that all the experts are wrong. And I read this thing on the internet that said, whatever, you know, um, brushing your teeth is bad for your hygiene. And so you're going you're gonna to believe that. Never mind that all, all dentists uh, disagree with it. But you know this guy is true because you read somewhere. Because why? Because you know. That's, that's, that's the opposite of the meekness of wisdom. Uh, meekness of wisdom, you, you know that there are, there are others with more knowledge and wisdom to whom you should yield to. Because they know what they're talking about. They know their business. And, and, you, and you don't. So the wise person knows uh, that the doctors know medicine better than, than they do. Uh, that they have, the doctors have reasons 
for what they say is good or harmful. Reasons that, can't, they, that say that I can't easily learn by just a few minutes of Google search. Who's that, who's that doctor think he is? I'm going to look it up you know, and, and come to my own conclusion in about five minutes. Uh, the wise person defers to the judgment of those who know better. Uh, the wise person understands that if something, say something is, is legal and wildly, w widely practiced, maybe like fluoride or something like that, uh, what they read on the internet about it causing cancer probably isn't true, right? All those experts who say it's a good, good thing are probably not all wrong, and you are happen to stumble on the truth because of something you read. Uh, that, you know, and if, if the, the, the issue here is do you have the meekness of wisdom? Uh, you, you know those claims probably aren't true, and you don't know why they're not true, these, these things you hear. You don't know why because you're not the expert, but you defer because you're meek, and you're meek because you're wise. The wise person respects the scientists who study, doesn't arrogantly scoff at their conclusions, oh, because you think, that's just dumb, those dumb scientists, I know better, but either about the age of the earth or climate change or whatever, he doesn't necessarily fall for everything, but um, you know, but, then, but he doesn't have the attitude because he read an article somewhere and they think they, one brief article gives them the, the ability now to pass judgment on the conclusions of people who spend their whole careers studying something. Sure, they might, these other people studying it might be wrong, but the wise person isn't so arrogant as to elevate himself uh, uh, to having a superior knowledge based on, on what, what little, you know, he or she has read. The wise person understands why Benjamin Franklin said that a, that a man who has himself for a lawyer has a fool for a client because he understands, the wise person does, that he can't make up for years of legal training just in a couple of hours of reading. Uh, I'm going to save myself all those legal fees because I'm going I'm to spend an hour reading about the law. Well, you'll probably lose too. What we're doing right now depends on the meekness of wisdom. The, the church depends on the meekness of wisdom. Because what we're doing at this very moment is a total waste of time if you don't have the meekness of wisdom. We're just going through the motions of acting like we're listening to a sermon. If we're just so arrogant, we're not going to be taught anything. A church full of people who think they know better that they don't need to listen to anyone, that they don't need any leadership or they don't need any guidance, that, uh, no meekness, that is a collection of individuals, disconnected individuals, who will all soon go their own way whenever something is said or done that they don't agree with because they won't submit to anything. They'll go find someone who agrees with their preconceived opinions or just stay home and say, you know, who? I don't need to listen to anybody. Maybe they go somewhere where someone will never challenge them. So they never grow to be Bereans who have a noble character to study scripture. Um, instead, they just, just assume they're right. They don't meekly listen to others, especially their leaders. The meekness of wisdom leads to being humble and yielding. But, in verse 14, if you have bitter jealousy, all of that gets short-circuited. The word translated jealousy... Now, I've got to respect the translators because they're experts and they know Greek better than I do. <laughs> all right. I better show some meekness of wisdom. And I'll say, these translators are all wrong and I'm right because I spent five minutes looking at a Greek dictionary. But the word translated jealousy is actually broader, I think, uh, than, than mere jealousy. Jealousy is a kind of it, uh, of envy. It is actually the same word that can be translated as zeal in other places, just in just, before in Sunday school, we saw the scripture that says, do, you know, do not let your zeal flag. Don't lose your zeal. That's the same word as here. So it's kind of odd. In Romans 12, Paul is saying, keep your zeal up. And here in James, James is saying, beware of bitter zeal. It's the same word. But it is bitter here, modified as bitter, shows that these, this zeal... These strong desires, that's what zeal is. Zeal is a strong desire, a quest. A, I'm gonna, I want that. Uh, but here that is bitter, show that the strong desires are not good. It's not a godly zeal. It's not a sweet zeal. The bitter zeal is for some crusade for yourself. A never-ending battle to do things your way. It's, it's Siamese twin, it's here. You know, if you have bitter jealousy or bitter zeal, 
and selfish ambition. That's a Siamese twin. It's connected to it. Uh, I, I, think, I think in a way there are two sides of the same coin, bitter, um, bitter jealousy or bitter zeal and selfish ambition, the quest that, that I be somebody. That's what ambition is, right? I want to be somebody. That's not necessarily wrong to want to be accomplished in whatever you do and um, serve or be, be, be good. But here it's a selfish ambition. It's all for me, for my name, so I'll, I'll be known and, you know, be um, prominent. The, the church is often the arena, and here's this great that James warns us of this, because this is, a, in my opinion, and this is what James would even be saying, this is one of the things that just destroys, undermines churches. Whether it makes them crumble so that no one goes, or it just makes them dysfunctional, or makes them do something else than they're supposed to be doing, uh, is selfish ambition. The church is often the arena. It's the place people go um, if they want the recognition they crave. Uh, Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, that the one aspiring to the office of overseer, or elder, is aspiring to a noble task. The task itself is noble. But sometimes people want the office for ignoble or for selfish reasons. And, and a lot of time we think, well, selfish, what do you mean? They can, get, they can milk it for money. They can you know, get money for themselves out of the church or something. No, not necessarily. Sometimes there's no money involved. Uh, but one of, the, one of the goods, one of the things people crave, it's not just money or sex, one of the things people crave is recognition, to be looked up to, you know, to, to be somebody. People, some people crave that. Many people crave that. Some have a bitter inwardly uh, zeal to be seen as somebody, and they will sacrifice greatly for it. They'll, they'll sacrifice a lot of their own money. They'll sacrifice their comfort. They'll work hard to, to, to be that person. But they aren't serving necessarily the church or the Lord. They're doing it for themselves. They have a bitter zeal for themselves. You know, right now you're thinking, then how can you tell the difference? They're doing it for themselves or for the Lord? Well, a lot of times it's hard. And over time it comes out. Bitter zeal and selfish ambition are the opposite, though, of the, of the meekness of wisdom. You notice how they're paired here. The meekness of wisdom, but on the other hand is this stuff. Bitter zeal, selfish ambition, they're, 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 they're the opposites. Um, um, selfish ambition might take the form of that green-eyed monster of envy, uh, uh, resenting what other people have. And here he's talking about, particularly about relationships in the church. Maybe you resent the, the, the money or the, the success that, this, that they've had. Um, they've been successful and you've been struggling. Or the status that they have. Uh, or maybe that in the church so-and-so is getting recognition that I'm not. Um, the quest is to have our ego satisfied by being called somebody, getting a title. Or if you can't get that, bringing down someone else who has it. Maybe with criticism. Um, if you have that in your heart, that bitter zeal, selfish ambition, deep down inside, that's why you won't listen. That's why you won't. That's why you think you know better. So you rarely, some of these people rarely attend church or Bible studies, or if they do, it's because they're in charge of them. Or, or if, if, or if you do it, they do attend church. Um, they, they don't really listen. Um, because, you know, their attitude is, who's that guy to tell me anything? Who, you know, I don't want to listen to him. I know better. I'll find someone who agrees with me, because after all, I'm mature and knowledgeable enough uh, to only need to listen to people who tell me what I already believe. If that's your attitude, then in the second half of verse 14, don't boast and be false to the truth. What's the truth? The truth is that you have some bitter zeal and selfish ambition that you need to deal with. Don't boast and deny that. Don't boast by, by implication. Uh, you're boasting by not listening. If you're not listening, you are boasting by, by the fact of not listening. You are boasting and that you're saying, I don't need to listen. That's what you do when you don't listen. You say, I don't need to. I know enough already. I know better than you. Boast by not attending church or Bible studies, unless, unless you're in charge, of course. Denying the reality of your bitter zeal and selfish ambition. The, the arrogance in your heart uh, that is quick to speak 
and slow to listen and, and quick to be upset when you don't get your way. Don't deny that if you have it. Don't deny the reality of, of what your conduct shows in your heart. That's what James is saying. I'm talking, speaking to you. I say you. I hope no one hears like that. That's the way James is written. He's talking to them. He says, you, your selfish ambition, don't deny that. So I'm saying the same way to you. I hope you're not like that, though. I hope you're better than some of these people James is talking to. I think you are. Uh, the tragedy, though, the great twist, the, the complication that, that really muddies the waters is that this bitter zeal and selfish ambition, selfish ambition you say it like that, it sounds, man, that's bad. That, that looks awful, and you think of this Again, like a green-eyed monster, you can, man, this is something I don't want anywhere near me. But the reality is, this thing that's the opposite of meekness, this is looked up to by many as spirituality. If you just dress it up in the right way, you, know, and it's not, you, know, you, you veil it, you, 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 you dim the lights a little bit. It, it, this is spirituality, they think. Whatever, you, maybe you speak some, some 17th century English, these and thous, or brother so-and-so, sister, you know, whatever. I don't mean to mock that. But. It's a kind of spirituality. What he's talking about here, it sounds so awful, because it is awful, bitter zeal and selfish ambition, which brings about every vile work, is a kind of spirituality. It's what, what is denounced here is looked up to by many people as, as godliness. That it's, it is the certitude, it's the attitude that, that, you, that you develop if you have faith, that faith gives you, they say. So that's what's so awful about this. It, it, you know, we're not talking about something like triple X, you know, pornographic movies that you're going to even tell that's awful or, you know, something satanic. This is something that comes across looking as if it is Christian, as if it's sanctified. But it's the opposite of sanctified. In James' day, uh, in, the, in the time of the early church, uh, in the culture that James is writing this, meekness was not looked up to. It was not respected. It wasn't respected as a virtue, as a good fruit. So he's not like, this is not a cultural religion that's just kind of helping people live up to the aspirations of their environment, of their culture. This is the opposite of that. The dominant morality in the Greek and Roman culture saw meekness as, as groveling, as servile. It's what people displayed only, only because they had to. You know, if they're just they're poor servants, and that's they had to beg. That's what they had to. They're, they're the kind of people that couldn't grab what's theirs. They couldn't demand their rights because they had no rights. They couldn't throw their weight around because they didn't have any weight. They had no choice then but to be meek. And so you just, at best, maybe you felt sorry for them. But this is, this is not a virtue in their culture. A, a, a Greek philosopher named Epictetus, who lived at the same time as James, listed meekness as a moral fault, a vice, not a virtue. So, so keep that in mind. Uh, what James here is holding up as the good fruit to have, meekness. The culture around them was saying is weakness. And that attitude still lingers in our culture. You know, even that, in other words, that was, that was Western culture 2,000 years ago. Cultures don't change very easily and very fast. I, I think Christianity changed it a lot, but not completely. That still lingers. That's still around in our culture. And the sad thing is, in some places, the culture change the Christianity, the religious culture. I've been told, for example, never to say, I don't know. So, a pastor gave me that advice. A pastor gave me that advice of spirituality. Was teaching a class. Someone asked me a question and said, I don't know. And he later came back to me and said, don't ever say, I don't know. Right? I, I've, been, you know, I've been told never to say weak words like probably. You know, I, I'll probably go. I'll maybe be there. Or apparently. Apparently it's that way. But I'm not sure. You know, I've been told never to, don't talk like that. You, you, get, you got to assert that you're certain, even if you're not. That's seen as spiritual by many people today. The, the wisdom 
behind that, there is a kind of wisdom behind that, and it probably makes sense, and it probably works some of the time, and that is that if you admit that you're not all-knowing, that you admit that you, you, you realize that you might be wrong, then if that's the case, people won't listen to you when there are things that you really do know are true. And that's probably the case sometimes. You know, w- w- one of the reasons, the main reason I don't tell a lot of stories about myself, at least I try not to, sometimes in introductions, um, one of the reasons I don't like, I don't, uh, the sermon shouldn't be about mostly myself. Um, second, secondly, I should make myself a hero, so I try, to, I try to eliminate illustrations most of the time in which I'm, I'm, the, I'm, the, I'm the model you should follow. I, I, don't, I'm, I don't like that. It's a habit, at least. But it, then I could say I could use myself as a bad example, and I could do a lot of that. I have a lot of examples which I'm the one you should not follow and learn from my mistakes. But if I did that a lot, there are certain people, weak people, a little worldly, in that area, who would get the attitude, man, he's got a lot of problems. I'm glad I don't have as many problems as him. I'm not going to listen to anything he says because he's got all those problems. They would think that way. And that's a weakness. The attitude is never show weakness or meekness. And everything is clear. Everything is certain. I'm on top of the world. I got my life in a robe and the duck's in order. You know it absolutely. And so you don't need to listen to anyone. And we just kind of come here to celebrate our greatness, our mutual greatness. Uh, I once got into a discussion, really close to being an argument, with a man who was a pastor with no theolo- he had no theological education. He had been to college maybe a year or two. Uh, and we got into a disagreement about Puritanism, which happened to be my area of expertise. Okay? Uh, he was sure of his opinion, and I was sure he was wrong. Uh, but uh, I not only knew he was wrong, but it was, it, I was interested to try to get into the head of a man who was so certain but knew so little. Why do you know almost nothing? I try to ask him, where is your education on, you know, I didn't say it quite like this, you know, this subject that I spent like four years almost full-time studying, uh, why do you think you know so much about it that that you can... tell me and uh well he said he w- w- once had a sunday school class on it oh um, okay uh, what makes people think like that to to be ignorant and sure at the same time i'm, I'm still not sure what it is well it's probably what was described here but understand that trait that makes him so certain of what he knows nothing about is exactly What made him be seen as spiritual by some, that trait is exactly what got him to be called pastor by some in this culture. James says in verse 15, this is not the wisdom that comes from above, otherwise from God. It's not a fruit of the spirit. It's not a godly spirituality. It's the kind many people like, but it's not the kind the Lord likes. It is, James says, three things. He describes it with three terms. It's earthly, comes from the earth. In other words, it's, it's practical. It's what people says, it, it says works. If you just act so sure of yourself, you have a good gift for the gab, people will follow. That's the way people are. So it works. It's from the earth. Second is, the ESV has unspiritual. The word there in Greek is actually where we get the word psyche from. Like as in psychology. In other words, it's psychological. It's soulish. It's emotional. It's from human flesh and human feelings. And third, this is the most striking term, it's demonic. It's demon-like. You know, it's like Satan who boasted that I will ascend to God's throne. I will impose my will. It's true. It's clear. Because I say it is. I'm certain, even if I don't have any idea what I'm talking about. Imagine there's a demonic spirituality. Okay? There's a spirituality in our culture, a kind of religious attitude that people, people look up to, people aspire to. People see it and say, this is what it means to be like God, to be a godly person. 
and the Bible says it's demonic. Imagine that. What kind of wisdom do you like? The kind that's earthly, psychological, demonic, or the one that's meek? How do we know this popular kind of wisdom is earthly, demonic, and, and demonic, uh, and psychological and demonic? Because in verse 16, uh, where these Siamese twins of bitter zeal and selfish ambition exist, where the church is poisoned with them, it will bring, he says, disorder. Everyone's doing whatever is right in their own eyes. You know, they're, they're, you can't, it's like trying to herd cats. You can't, you can't do it. There's no covenant keeping. There's no faithfulness. There's no submission. There's no respect. And uh, every vile practice, uh, the way they were nurtured to be, to, uh, to assert themselves, to grasp for what they can get, but it results in, in, in tearing the, the church apart. Uh, the one who demands things be done his way, who won't submit meekly either to the majority of the leadership or the congregation, you know, just insists that he's right. He has a wisdom that is from this world, that's soulish, that's emotional, that's satanic. Is that your kind of spirituality? I hope not. What kind of wisdom do you like? The wisdom that is from above, from God, produces seven qualities in verse 17. Look at chapter 3, verse 17. This is a key verse for this whole passage. Chapter 3, verse 17. This is, he, he talks about it. The wisdom that is from above is, but I think what he, he means is, this is what the person is like who has the wisdom that is from above. This is what it makes you like if you have it. If you have the wisdom that's from above, from God, you'll be first, seven things, pure. In other words, your, your motives are not mixed with selfish ones. You're not, yeah, you like a little of that hearing the word of God, but you also want to make, you know, be the big man. And so that's partly why you go to church. You, you're mixed motives. No, it's first, pure. Second, you are peaceable. Uh, your words and your actions are, are geared to creating peace. You're thinking about not, not, uh, not only peace for yourself, that's great, peace for the church. What makes the church peaceful? These other peaceful. You're not just thinking about, well, I want, I want up there. I want on the stage. I want to be looked up to. I want this or that. I want the money. What, what makes for peace? You, uh, um, you, and I'm not talking about the, the fake peace of say, kind of just placating bitterly zealous people. You can get some temporary peace. Someone is bitterly zealous and they're demanding something and you kind of cave into them. Kind of like having a child throwing a temper tantrum and you, you give into them to keep them quiet. But that, that, that kind of, quote, peace, that won't last very long. The true peace, though, of reconciled relationships, that you're really considering others and, and, and hopefully they will notice and they'll do the same. Third, you are gentle. It's the third quality you will have. You have the wisdom from above. You'll be gentle. You'll be patient. Now, tolerating others rather than you know, bringing out that flamethrower of accusations like we saw last week. Fourth, you'll be open to reason. Isn't that interesting? Do people think of Christians being open to reason? Some kind they don't. I think the spiritual they should. Uh, the, and open to reason there's debate about what that term means in Greek. Compliant to others' reasonable request and, and needs. You know, Wayne is very compliant to reasonable requests, but sometimes I like to test him with some unreasonable ones just to make sure he will say no, and he will. You know, come, come to my house and change my car, oil in my car or something like that. No, no, you can take care of yourself, right? But uh, if, if, he, if you need him, he'll, he'll reasonably, he'll probably come and help. Deferring to others, yielding to persuasion. It's the opposite of the person who refuses to listen, no matter, you know, what, no matter the facts are against him. Or the headstrong person who won't consider anything else, no matter how they are appealed to. Right. I think King James only people fit right in there. No matter, no matter how many facts you show them, uh, uh, the, the, the King James maybe was good for its time 400 years ago, but you know, now we need newer translations. No matter how many facts you show them, they just... Those are perversions, modern perversions of the Bible, not versions. No, okay, whatever. Close to reason. Uh, fifth, though, uh, you are full of mercy and good fruit. You're kind to others, in other words. You, you, you're, you consider them. Six, uh, you're, you're impartial. It seems kind of odd in this. What does it mean to be impartial? But in other words, you're not always suspecting some people um, because they're not your kind. Um, because they are an authority, maybe, if you're American. Uh, you think, well, they're an authority. They must be doing something wrong. 
That's the, that's the American attitude. Uh, your culture teaches you always suspect people in authority. Um, or or um, you give others who you like, who are your kind, the benefit of the doubt. And what that does, you know, partiality produces conflict, doesn't it? Because people who see that they're being ignored, maybe because of their race or because of their culture, they end up resenting it. I mean, you don't blame them either. I would resent it too. So you know, when one child in a family is preferred over another, they resent it, don't they? You want to cause conflict in the family? Start openly preferring one kid over another. Uh, Jacob's partiality, think about it in the book of Genesis, Jacob's partiality to Joseph brought about that conflict in the family. Uh, when, when you favor one group over another in the church, you know, the, the people who are discriminated against get upset. In our culture, they just probably go off and form their own church, but there's, there's divisions and hostility. But impartiality, on the other hand, brings peace. People see that, you know, you're not discriminating against them. Seventh, the last one, you're sincere. Uh, again, with the motives, uh, motives that are what you say they are. You say you want to serve, you really do. You say, I want to help the kids, Jim, you, you really do. It's not just something you say. Uh, that there, you are really are for the good of the church, not just for your own agenda. And notice here something peculiar, because I, I, I remember, memorized this verse and thought a lot about it. There's something peculiar about this list of seven qualities. The, the first, pure, is a lot like the, the last, sincere. Right? Sincere is having pure motives. So you, 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 you're wor- you are what you said you are. The second, peaceable, is like the second to last, impartial. Because remember, avoiding you, by being impartial, you avoid the conflict stirred, stirred up by par- partiality. The third, gentleness, is like the third to last, uh, mercy and good fruits. And that leaves then the, the fourth one, which is the middle one, uh, open, that is open to reason, yielding to persuasion, s- submissive, deferential, meekness. It leaves that as the, sort of the, the pinnacle of this list. The, 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 the summit uh, in this mountain of virtues uh, from which, uh, which the wisdom from above produces in you. Op- op- be open to reason. If you have it from God, it will make you open to reason, deferential, meek. That, in turn, produces, in verse 18, a, a harvest of righteousness. All the fruit of the Spirit. It, it is planted in your life, and the life of the church is planted by peacemakers. And you get it peacefully. Is that the kind of wisdom you like? What kind of friends do you like? What kind of friends do you like, Raymond? Friends who read Harry Potter? Uh, if you like having the world as your friend, that's, that's going to cause problems. Uh, what causes fights and quarrels? He asked, in the church, among you, and those in the church. What causes fights and quarrels? Well, it's what you like. Uh, What you desire causes you to bump up against others who desire something different. Why are there often fights in church, but not in business or in sports? Maybe in business, they'll fire you. That's part of it. (laughs) In business, people uh, may even get along well with competitors. You know, they don't resent their competitors. They, They know that that their business is out to make money. It's not out to hurt the competitors. It's just there happen to be competitors there. Well, that's the way it is. You know, we have people from four competing Chinese restaurants right here. At least four. Yeah, right, yeah, count. Yeah, right. White Long River, uh, Great Wall Blue Park, uh, China Dragon, and uh, First Taste. There we go. All with pretty close to each other. And they seem to be getting along nicely. I haven't seen them fighting each other recently. Uh, <laughs> uh, in, in sports, a, a team is united around the goal. Uh, of winning, because you know, in a, in a, say, football team, they they know what they they exist for. They exist to to win the game, and that's what they want above all. In and, and, and both, in and all of this, they they know what they're about. But the the, the difference is, I think, in church, why are there fights and quarrels? Because in church, we, people might say they're about we're about serving God. That's what we're here for. We're about growing ourselves to be like that list of seven things. To be, uh, and, and then being used by him to reach others, all to glorify the Lord. But some people just say that and aren't sincere. 
They're full of, you know, those Siamese twins, that bitter zeal, that selfish ambition. Their passion, really, is for their ego. So the conflicting motives, so you have some people then who are like that for, the, for their ego, they want to be entertained, and then there's others who are sincere, who want to serve the Lord, and they're all, they're all together, and then there's conflict because these things are hitting against each other. Conflicting motives leads to conflict. James says in verse 2, you desire and you do not have, so you murder. Now, I don't think he means literally that they were murdering each other, you know, were stabbing each, literally stabbing each other in the back. But I think he means what he was described earlier here in his book. You see a brother or sister, you know, needy, doesn't have enough clothes, keep warm in the winter, doesn't have enough food, and you just say, be warm, be filled. Get lost after that. You know, that's what you mean. That's what you, don't, you don't say get lost, but that's what you want. But you're not going to give your own things. I think what he means is that some of these people, they desired whatever they desired. They, they desired that, ne- that nice new car. They desired their fancy vacation. They desired their jewelry. They desired their gadgets. And um, they didn't care for the needs of other members. They spent on themselves, and they didn't share to provide for the needs of a brother or sister. And so, for all they cared, just let them die. Live and let die is their attitude. Now, they wouldn't actually kill them, but they would let them die. As long as they got their luxury car or their trip to Disney World or their gadgets, you covet, you want, you're greedy for something, you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You're just frustrated. You take out your frustrations with others. Frustrated you didn't get what you want, like a spoiled child at Christmas. So you resent others who da- do have what you want or who have what they want. You do not have because you do not ask in prayer, talking about. You ask God and do not receive. I want to know why you pray and sometimes don't get what you pray for. You ask, do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Pray for more people at church. Maybe, maybe it's because I want to be, well, I'm not supposed to share bad things about myself, am I? Because some of you may take that the wrong way. Maybe I want to be the big man. Is that, is that my passion? It's not really about the glory of God, about growing and serving. It's about, about me. Or maybe for you, it's about you. Why are we like that? It's the friends we like. It's our friends. In verse 4, you adulterous people. It's an adulterous. Adulterous someone is having a unfaithful to one relationship and having another one you shouldn't have. Unfaithful, you adulterous, adulteresses literally, you adulterous people. You're unfaithful to God like a spouse committing adultery. Instead of faithfulness to God, you're, you're seeking friendship with the world. Uh, but appeasing the world means opposing God. Appeasing the world means opposing God. It's a stark choice. You can't have both. You have to choose. What kind of friends do you like? You've got to choose. You, you can't have both. If you wish to be a friend of the world, to, to be somebody in their eyes, uh, to be liked, to be the big man or whatever it is, and that's just your, the main thing of your life, for the guys that work to like you, to be popular, that, now that might come about as sort of a fringe benefit, you know, if you're, you're sincerely seeking God, uh, you're like what's described in chapter 3, verse 17, and people see that you're really wanting to do good to all people, especially the household of faith, but to all people, that your religion isn't just a ruse for self-seeking. And they may respect that, and they may like you for it. But if your end goal, your real quest, that is the thing that really drives you, is to gain the approval of your neighbors, then you are making an enemy out of God. Your, your neighbors, by the way, sure you should love your neighbor as yourself, but your neighbors who you, here you have to love less than God, that you have to be careful you're not trying to uh, appease them, and so opposing God, your neighbors, Jesus tells us, who may tempt you away, who may make you an enemy of God, may be your wife, your husband, your children, your parents. If we seek a relationship with them above the Lord, we're rejecting the Lord. 
This is the folly of worldliness. Worldliness isn't about your, your style of dress or what kind of music you like to listen to or what you drink. Uh, it's about who, deep down in your heart, you are trying to please, what that zeal is in your heart for. What's it for? Ian Murray described worldliness, quote, Worldliness is departing from God. It's a man-centered way of thinking. It proposes objectives which demand no radical breach with man's fallen nature. It judges the importance of things by the present and material results. It weighs success by numbers. It covets human esteem and wants no unpopularity. It knows no truth for which it is worth suffering. It declines to be a fool for Christ's sake. If deep in our hearts we desire the applause of the world, maybe even corporately, sort of to be the respectable church. You know, all about, we're all about family and, and pulling your pants up and, and country, and we have programs for everything you could possibly want from the cradle to the grave. We, we're all about being popular with you, Caswell County, Danville. Then we aren't worshiping the Father in spirit and in truth. We're not the kind of worshipers uh, that he seeks. In verse 5, he yearns, it says, the, 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 God himself yearns with a holy jealousy that our hearts, that our spirits, that he originally breathed into us, that they would belong to him, that, they would, that we would yearn for him, to worship him. You know, Jesus said a similar thing in John 4. The Father seeks. In other words, he's on a quest. The Father is looking for worshipers. In spirit, I think it means in their own hearts, not just through the forms, but in spirit and in truth, sincerely, genuinely, according to his truth. That's what the Father is seeking. Here, he yearns for that. And, and we said we would. We said we would be that. We would be seeking him and worshiping him. James here is speaking to Christians, uh, people who claim to love God and seek first his kingdom, but we committed spiritual adultery by seeking to make friends with the world, too. That we got a little on the side, right? What's adultery? Adultery is thinking you have both when you got to choose, when you got to have only one. But adultery, you think you have two. No, you can't. You have to choose. You can't have people approving of us, at least that be your quest, have people approve of you and God approving of you. You can't have both. Adultery. He would be right then. To divorce us. If your spouse commits adultery, you, you can divorce. Here, we commit adultery. He can divorce us. But, in verse 6, do you see this coming? I mean, this is strong stuff. A lot of strong criticism of words to the church. He, he calls his, the church here, hopefully not us, adulteresses. You're, you're adulterers. And yet, he gives more grace. Who, who would have seen this coming? He gives more grace. More than that amazing grace that originally drew us to himself, that caused us to first believe. He gives us grace enough to repent again, to reconcile that relationship we tore with our spiritual adultery, to repent of our ongoing draw to selfish ambition, to care more about the things that we can get for ourselves than what we can do for others in the body, for, for being so arrogant that we won't listen. Yeah, to, be, to being so arrogant, you know, we, even we sit through sermons, but we just don't think we know better. He gives us grace to choose the wisdom that comes from above over the kind that comes from the earth that appeals to our ego, our feelings, that is demonic. He gives us more grace so we can humble ourselves. We can admit our preference for that demon-like wisdom admit our spiritual adultery, and finally becoming humble, we get more grace. You notice that? He gives us more grace. What's it lead to? If we obey the command, the, the ability that grace gives us, we humble ourselves, and he gives grace to the humble. How do you get grace? It takes grace to give grace. God gives yet more grace to the humble, so we can resist the devil in his kind of wisdom. Resist him like soldiers on the wall, you know, uh, pushing back the invaders, trying to invade us. But you push them back, he'll flee. 
We can have the grace to really draw near to God, not, not because we're coveting something that he selfishly, uh, coveting something we selfishly want him to give us. You know, he'll give us prosperity. He'll give us the, the best life now if we only, you know, do the right rules and get right with him. No, because we meekly want him to draw near to us. We cleanse our hands of the filth of selfish ambition. Hands filthy from trying to grasp for, for money, for stuff, for a name for ourselves. We purify our hearts of our mixed motives and become single-minded, no longer double-minded, thinking like the world in one part of our mind, that, that demonic spirituality and maybe like the Lord in another, double-minded, unstable. We keep going back and forth between the two. No. Meekly, we admit we are a wretch. You know, he says, mourn and weep, you wretch. We admit that, yes. That our self-satisfied laughter is turned to godly grief that produces a repentance as we sense how our selfishness and arrogance has offended the Lord. He gives more grace so we can humble ourselves. And when we do, he gives us even more grace. And he gives us grace enough to exalt us if, like Abraham, we are friends of God. What kind of friends do you like? Finally, very briefly, uh, what kind of judges do you like? Yourself as the self-appointed judge or God? You've got to choose. You can't have both. If you're speaking evil against each other, your brothers or sisters in Christ, in other words, fellow church members, you're setting yourself up as a judge. Now, here, he's not saying, I, I don't think, uh, you just can't say anything critical about anyone no matter what they do. You know, that, that poor, that, that sweetheart Adolf Hitler, man, hope it's all right for him. No, no, come on. Uh, he's not saying don't judge by God's word. He's not saying don't call sin, sin. Don't, don't submit to his judgment on some action. Right? God has expressed his, as the judge, he has expressed his judgment. And we're actually being arrogant if we, if we don't agree with his judgment about something. Right? According to God's judgment, is Adolf Hitler bad? Of course he is. He's a mass murderer. So we agree with his judgment by telling the truth about him. Uh, you know, about it, anything. We, we can say, according to God's word, say sex, out of marriage, sex outside of marriage is wrong, or breaking your word is wrong. We can say, according to what God has revealed in the Bible, uh, the prosperity gospel is unbiblical. Okay? He doesn't mean you, you don't, saying that, agreeing with the judgment God has already made, that, that's, that you can't do that, no. All right? They say one of the, the pop, most popular, they say the last generation, the most popular verse of the Bible was John 3.16, and now it's Matthew 7.1, you know, judge not. And people use that to excuse whatever they do. And uh, that's, not, that's not what James here means either. He means don't assert your opinion as the standard of judgment. You say that worldly rap music is awful. Or drinking that is ungodly. You've got to abstain from that. Or doing that, whatever it is, is that is, is wrong. Well, says who? Says you? Why do you think you have the right to set up your opinions... Your, your taste, the kind of music you like or the kind of drinks you like, whatever, as the standard to judge others. When you do that, you not only show a great deal of arrogance, as though, as though your opinions were inerrant, you know, without error, you, you speak evil against God's law, the, 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 the law, the, the perfect law of liberty. You know, he called it earlier in this letter. You're saying, when you do that, you assert your opinion as the standard that that if, if God knew what he was doing, if he wasn't so incompetent, that God, I'm trying to straighten him out, that he would have included my opinions in the Bible. So now I'm, I'm, now I'm saying what God should have. That's what people do when they assert their opinions. Who's the judge? You are. Oh, you say God is, but you've set yourself up as the judge of the judge, as sort of the Supreme Court. And over God. So now you're not a doer of the law in verse 11. You're just a self-appointed judge. The law commands love. We respond with defamatory talk, setting ourselves up as if we know better, saying, you know, it should have commanded uh, 
me at least, to criticize. That's what it should have done. So I'm going to change it, at least for myself. Trying to take God's place on the judgment seat. To value our opinions above, in actual practice, what God has inspired in his word is to value ourselves above him. He's the only lawgiver and judge, the, the one who can save from judgment or destroy. That leads to the question in verse 12. Who are you? You know, it's like, who do you think you are? Who are you to judge your neighbor, your brother, your sister? You're not the judge. There's three kinds we have to choose from. Kinds of wisdom, of friends, of judges. But they all really come down to, to one choice. Are we driven by our own ego, our, our bitter zeal? For our agenda. We fight and we resist because of our selfish desires. We don't care about each other's needs because we're too full of care for our own needs. And when we do think of our brothers and sisters, we do so as if we were the judges pronouncing our verdicts rather than their servants. Deep in our hearts, you know, beneath all the religious dress and the spiritual talk, do we harbor selfish ambition? passions for ourselves while in reality we are unfaithful to god more interested in being liked you know by the people around us the the, the people at work or to be somebody steamed and you know in your line of work looked up to is that what we're most interested in have have you been liking the wrong kind of wisdom of friends of judges if so, remember God is the only lawgiver and judge. He's the only one able to save and destroy. Remember that and tremble, shudder like the demons, weep for your sins, let your self-satisfied glib happiness be turned into gloom as you grieve over your sins, your, your bad spirituality, as you humble yourself. For your offensive arrogance before a holy God. But remember. Remember the good news. Maybe we didn't see coming. Despite our adultery, our, our sins, our selfish ambition. Remember. He gives more grace. 